Your what's good, everybody? What's good, YouTube? It's your boy, No Nation, man. Today, we got a new special video, man. NBA TV's The Dream Team Documentary. You guys have wanted me to react to the Dream Team Documentary of 1992 Olympics. And um, I just want to let you guys know that we just finished another documentary. The first documentary that I ever had on his channel. We just finished that one. And you guys have been actually rocking with those videos. You know what I'm saying? Almost, I think part one and part two, they hit 1K. And part three hit 825K. Uh, I'm 825 views not 25 i hope one day but yeah one take anyway so <laughs> yeah it hit 100 825 views and um and yeah man you guys really love that documentary so this documentary you guys wanted me to react to it um and yeah let's get straight to it bro like for real for real uh i think today's gonna be uh part one of the documentary i'm gonna split into parts two this documentary is slightly a, a slightly a little bit um shorter than the than the other one so i think i think this documentary is just, documentary is just gonna be two parts um also if there's anything that's like muted or anything like that that's because of copyright issues sometimes you know the, these documentaries be having copyrighted music and shit like that and uh you know um yeah so with that being said, uh, let's get straight to the video. If you're new here, hit that like button, comment, subscribe. You know all that. Boop. Finish that. Finish that. Let's get straight to the video, man. Why do people talk about dreams so much in sports? I don't know. Dream seasons. Dream matchups. Dream opportunities. Who is that? They do it because so much of sports is about imagining what you want things to be like. Wow. If only the setting were just right. It was one of those times none of us will ever forget. The characters, just right. I don't know anything about Angola, but Angola's in trouble. The timing, <laughs> just right. 11 Hall of Famers. I don't think you can ever do that again at no point in time. If only it could all be the way you might have dreamed it up yourself. Are you filming? Yep. Shit, I could have been on that team too. That was the most exhilarating 15 seconds of my life. People perceived us as being superheroes. Please, Michael Jordan! No Isaiah Thomas No Isaiah Thomas question. Cool. We became a team. Damn, a team. we said no Isaiah Thomas. They got beef with Isaiah Thomas? What? Why? Can someone put in the comments, bro? Like, put in the comments down below. Why did why they have beef with Isaiah Thomas? He said, no Isaiah Thomas questions, bro. Don't ask me that shit. <laughs> no Isaiah Thomas No Isaiah Thomas questions. Cool. Damn. We became a team, and that team just why? stomped on everybody. This never happened in sports. Nowhere. Well, I figured eventually there'd be a movie made about the Dream Team. <laughs> The greatest team ever assembled in the history of team sports. The dream team. I can't wait to I can't wait to see what this what this entails, man. God bless you and God bless America. Twenty years can go by pretty fast. And the world isn't going to stop and wait for you to remember what it used to look like. 1992 was a time of change. New faces in America quickly transforming into cultural icons. Fresh Prince, baby. Yo, yo, Fresh Prince, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, bro. That was probably one of my, that's one of my favorite TV shows for sure, for sure. Faces in America quickly oh, transforming into cultural <laughs> Fresh icons. Fresh Prince. None more so than the superstars of the NBA. The Repeat it. Let the party begin. After the legends of the 80s have lifted the league's profile to new heights, a fresh crop of players have blown the lid off. There's Hewitt. Robinson. Yes. Their talents and their charisma made them more than just basketball players. I am not a role model. They were a new kind of star athlete whose popularity transcended the game. Like Mike, if I could be like Mike. Is 
the shoes. <laughs> no, Mom. And now the very best of them awaited their brightest showcase, the world's largest athletic stage, the Olympic Games in Barcelona, Spain, even if no one truly realized the impact they would make there. It's a watershed moment in the history of sports, not just, not just the Olympics, not just basketball. Um, it, it, it moved the culture along. But in 1992, not everyone was ready for them. Not everyone thought pro basketball stars had a place in the Olympics. Mm, this kind of thing had never, ever, ever been done. I think I think I think this year was this year was the first time they actually featured NBA players, like, which is like kind of weird to me. Like, why would they? Why why, would, why is it that year? Like the first time they've they allowed NBA players to play in the Olympics? Is it like, what? A that shit should have been happening. You know, poking the bear, if you will, by people in my profession. Sports journalists and journalists in general were skeptical, angry. Charles Buffy was a nut. Yeah, because this wasn't the Olympic movement. The Olympic ideal had always been about amateur competition, which meant the United States had always sent basketball teams made up of college kids. Mm. Teams that dominated for decades. Premier, Etats Unis. In 1972, the Soviet Union was awarded a victory over the U.S. in a controversial gold medal game. The United States apparently had won the game, but the debate still goes on. To this day, that American team still hasn't claimed their silver medals. But that result seemed like a fluke. Oh, and also, if you guys don't know, in 1976, Montreal hosted the Summer Olympics. That's my city, man. Yes, sir, Montreal gang. Put the comments down below if you from Montreal, man. Montreal gang. When the Americans got the gold in their next two Olympic appearances. The U.S. has its ninth gold medal. While the U.S. celebrated, though, the rest of the world was catching up. So in 1988, when the Soviets won again, there was no talk of any fluke. The United States goes home with a semi-final. The U.S. celebrated, though, the rest of the world was catching up. So in 1988, when the Soviets won again, there was no talk of any fluke. The United States goes home with a semi-final loss to the bigger, more experienced USSR team. I was embarrassed. I know some of the guys left their medals there in the room. They didn't want to take them home. And here we are, um, USA on our chest, and we didn't get the job done. But the amateur ideal had gotten muddled. Wow. While NBA players were prohibited from Olympic competition, professionals from other leagues abroad could play. If you played in Europe for money, you were an amateur, but if you played in the RIP David for Stern, money, you were a professional. And so our players weren't eligible. Those other Damn. countries were using pros. Playing against 18, 19 year old kids. That is really unfair. Changing the hypocrisy, though, was a central goal of a European named Boris Stankovic, the head of FIBA, the World Basketball Federation. He was very much intent on lifting basketball up to the highest possible level of international sports. And if the whole world knew that the very best players in the world were not participating in the Olympics, that made it a second-class event. So in 1989, Stankovic issued a resolution to allow pros from all leagues to compete in the Olympics. But back in America, the NBA was lukewarm to the idea. We wanted to be good partners with FIBA to grow the sport of basketball, but we weren't particularly anxious. We didn't know what it would mean. We didn't know if our players would want to do it. We didn't know what the logistics were. But the vote passed, and NBA players were eligible for the Olympics. Now the issue wasn't about whether American pros could play, but whether the best players wanted to play. The one guy that, you know, that we were a little concerned about was probably Michael. The thought back then was Michael Jordan plays 36 holes of golf 90 days during the summer. What the hell is he going to be doing playing basketball? <laughs> I was hoping they would not ask me to participate. And uh, I was trying to figure out a way graciously that I could decline. I'd done the Olympic thing before, and 
when Rod Thorne called me and asked me, I wasn't gun ho about it. My appeal to him was, you're the top player in the world. This is bigger than the NBA Finals. And, you know, we need you. His thing, well, who else is playing? I mean, are all the good players going to play? You know, I'm not going to play by myself. So Michael Jordan waited to hear more. And Rod Thorne made his next call. It was a no-brainer for me. <laughs> you know, I was in from day one. And I figured if I jumped in first and said I wanted to play, that would get guys to want to participate as well. Next, yeah, it's like Magic Johnson playing? Hell yeah. Magic wasn't on that team. I don't think it would have been as spectacular as it was. And uh, to finish out our careers, that was important for both of us. Once you get guys like Magic and Larry committing to the team, then all of a sudden it, it becomes something very, very special. Um, mm -hmm. Representing the USA is already a, a tremendous honor, but to know that you're going to be on a dream team is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Magic, Bird, and David Robinson weren't alone in their pride. They called in the big guns. We're the Navy SEALs that we had to go over there and kick butt and take names. With those stars and the Utah Jazz tandem of John Stockton and Carl Malone, the dream team was starting to take shape. It don't matter if you call me last. I got the call. <laughs> oh, that dude's a nut too, bro. Carl Malone is a nut too, bro. <laughs> if you know, you know. <laughs> I didn't feel like that I deserved to be called, but uh, I truly uh, wasn't going to tell them that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm in. I didn't even think to say who else was on the team. I, that was it. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Yes. Charles Barkley's ability was never in question, but his attitude was. God wants us to win the world championship. <laughs> I don't know if I go that far, y'all. No, no, I talked to him another night. I learned early. He's in a nut. It doesn't matter what I say. <laughs> so from this day forward, I'm gonna say what the hell I want to say, and some people are gonna like it, and some people are gonna dislike it. But after a series of incidents on and off the court, the least of the committee's concerns were about what Barkley would say. I was asked to talk to him. He was so honored that we would even think about asking him. He convinced me that uh, you won't have any problems with me. Now, with the team nearly complete, Rod Thorne had enough talent secured to go back to where he started. Representing my country was a big thing. But I think, you know, the biggest motivation for me was now I get to spend time with some of the guys I compete against all the time. Mm. Portland's Clyde Drexler rounded out the list of NBA players, while the final spot on the roster was reserved for an amateur, Duke's Christian Leitner, coming off back-to-back -back NCAA titles. There's the pass to Leitner. Puts it up. Yes! In any other year. I ain't never heard of this dude before. What the hell? Why is he not talked about him enough, bro? Chris Leitner, I had never heard of this dude before, bro. But damn, he looked, he looked, he looked like he looked like he he was really like busting at like busting people's asses. Might have been the team's biggest star. But on this team, he was fine with being the last guy on the bench. I tell people this all the time, and it may shock them, but my most enjoyable year was my freshman year because they don't expect nothing from you except carry the luggage, do the laundry, and, and get our donuts. And that's easy. <laughs> the harder thing is to be the leader. By May of 1991, two months before the Olympics, the team was set. One college kid and 11 future Hall of Famers. The man charged with putting it all together was the unflappable Chuck Daly. OK, all set. Upset. Chuck looked the part. He was the guy that looked like he owned the arena, but he would also push the broom. Hey, yo, what do you guys feel about like the Redeem team from like 2012 and shit? No, 20, 20, 2008, sorry, 2008 with like LeBron, Kobe. Like, was that really like as good as this team, or do you guys think that was a little overhyped by the media? Like, what, what do y'all think about that, bro? His hair was beautiful. His suits were immaculate. He wanted to win, but he wanted to look good. As the head coach of the Detroit Pistons, 
Daly did both, winning back-to-back -back championships in 1989 and 90. The Pistons mm. are winners and still champions of the world. The Pistons were nicknamed the Bad Boys for their aggressive and some said dirty style of play, never more evident than in their memorable playoff battles with Michael Jordan's Bulls. Sheesh. This this white boy, this white boy right here, he was, yo, he was a nutcase too, bro. I forgot his name, but he was a nutcase God, too. Had no love for each other. So when Daly was named the Dream Team coach, many wondered how he'd handle working with the Bulls' biggest star. I was being asked to wrestle with some demons and some some issues. But the coach was well acquainted with the task of managing personalities. He coached the bad boys. And if you can coach those you can coach anybody. One player Daly wouldn't Damn. be coaching in the Olympics, however, was his own star in Detroit, point guard Isaiah Thomas, who controversially had been left off the team's roster. No matter how much people try to say now, you know, it was no big a deal. Uh, it was a big deal. Uh, I talked to Isaiah at the beginning of the year uh, about the aspect he wasn't on the team, and uh, he was not comfortable with it. Uh, I'm sure he is very hurt. He's a very deserving player, but, uh, you know, he was not selected. Thomas was Damn. well on his way to a Hall of Fame career, but was also seen by many as the biggest cultivator of the bad boy's image in Detroit. And now Isaiah Thomas and Bart Ryder swinging. Isaiah was the general. He was the guy that would yap at Hey, yo, 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 yo. Would you guys, would you guys actually like it if I actually reacted to, like, a NBA brawl, like the 2004 uh, Detroit Pistons brawl or, like, the 2006 Nuggets brawl? Like, let me know, bro. Let me know in the comments if you guys want me to react to <laughs> Or, like, NBA fights. Like, do you guys want me to react to those videos? Like, let me know. Am 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 I am I, am I, am I like am I gonna get like is my channel gonna get uh d deleted? Because <laughs> if you post because if you post stuff that's fighting and shit like that like it, it, like you, you could get deleted type shit. So just just let me know. <laughs> Bad boys image in Detroit. And now Isaiah Thomas and Bart Ryder swinging. Oh my gosh! Isaiah was the general. Sheesh. He was the guy that would yap at his teammates and say, knock him on the ass, do whatever you got to do. A beautiful backdoor pass from Pippen, and he is Wallop. He knew he was going to get hit. He pushed his shit out of Pippen. Did you want him on the dream team? No, I did not want him on the team. Damn. Did you want him on the team? Well, I can't speak for Michael, but uh, I don't think he wanted him on the team. <laughs> now, there has been speculation that your icy relationship with Isaiah Thomas is the reason that he was not selected. Well, what is your reaction to that? That was one of the stipulations put to me prior to me even committing that uh, Isaiah wasn't a part of the team. I was getting strong innuendos that it wasn't just, you know, it was coming from higher places that didn't want Isaiah Thomas on the team. Certain things are being pointed at me because of our relationship at, uh, and, of course, about the, the way that the, the end of the game between Detroit and Chicago uh, ended. We were picking the group just after the Pistons had been eliminated by the Bulls, and it was a very bad timing uh, for Isaiah. Damn. Everybody had fresh in their mind the picture of Isaiah walking off the court. Pistons wasting no time in getting out of here. They left the bench, although there's seven and nine, ten seconds remaining. The Pistons just left. When the Pistons walked off the court before the final bell, I, I think it left a bad taste in a lot of people's uh, mouths. They, they left the court because they were losing? I mean, shit, I mean, that's poor sportsmanship, bro. Like, you know, but when you lose, bro, like, especially when you just got off a championship from the previous year, like, you don't even care, like, you don't even care to shake nobody's hands, like, you know, like, you, you want to, you want to three-peat, so it's like, when you lose, you're like, man, man, I ain't gonna, sh I ain't gonna shake these guys' hands, like, hell no, nah, I don't like these dudes, and they don't like us, so it's like, you know, it, you know, but at the end of the day, bro, like, Good sportsmanship is, is way more respectful. You know what I'm saying? Like way more, way, way more respectable. Maybe if they would have shaked their hands and, and it would have just been like, "Yo, like good game," 
Shit, maybe he would have been on the team, man. Final bell. But, you I know, the NBA had an agenda. A lot of people's uh, you know? mouths. Okay. All right. No Isaiah Qu- Thomas No Isaiah stuff Thomas in. questions. Cool. Jordan Damn. and the team were done answering questions about Isaiah. But with training camp approaching, a bigger question would need to be answered. Hello, how you doing? How would the 12 stars that were selected play together? Welcome. What? How is that even a question? Training camp began on June 22, 1992, in La Jolla, California. And when the gym doors opened, no one was quite sure what to expect, especially the players themselves. It's a lot of egos in one gym and on one team. Everybody wanted their form to shine and showcase why they were a part of this team. With all these stars on the team, if it comes down to the last shot, who's going to take the shot? Me. Me. Everybody in the world has an ego. The only difference between us, we have a reason to have an ego. <laughs> Every one of us felt like we was a Everybody. And when practice started that first day, every player seemed to be trying to prove just how great they were. It was a very competitive Ooh. practice. Knocked them on his thinking, ass. Aren't we all on the same team? Patrick go, I don't want to play with David. I want to play against him. And you hear Michael say, I don't want to be on Magic's team. I want to play against him. Every evaluation of Michael Jordan at that time was, he's good, but he's never Magic Johnson. In my competitive nature, I want to use every little bit that I could gather so that I can gain an advantage. Carl Malone, he's the only guy I would even compare to myself at the power forward position. So I want to prove that I was the best power forward in the world. Charles. Yeah, he's a great talent. Do I think he's better than me? Hell no. <laughs> so let's do this. This is a nutcase. By the time this over with, you're going to be thinking I'm damn good too. The first practice, Barkley drives baseline, and Carl Malone jumps up like this. Barkley just dunked on him so hard. It was just an unbelievable play. Damn. I felt like, man, I cannot believe that I'm part of this practice. And they're probably talking shit in, in the practice too. Like, yo, your jump shot broke. Yo, you, sh- you, <laughs> yeah, yo, bro, shoot that shit, shoot that shit, bro. And, and then he missed it. Yeah, I, I, I knew you was gonna shoot that shit. <laughs> you good trash, bro. <laughs> I know they was talking shit the whole practice too. A few days later, the team had a chance to acclimate themselves to playing on the same side. Chuck Daly had scheduled the scrimmage against a select group of college players. A group thrilled to be facing off against their idols. I found out today I might be picking up magic a little bit full court, so, uh, you know, things are just happening for me that really, really makes me happy. My whole thought process was don't embarrass yourself, and, and that, that was like the theme for me, like just hang in there. A lot of those people that I've looked up That's to, Chris Webber, uh, no? Mark Lee Malone, a lot of those people talk confidence, and uh, I think it's going to be a good matchup, you know. No advantage on either side. Yo, Chris Webber, man. Chris Chris Webber would have been like the best power forward, man. If he would have just was, if he was not injured that much, bro. Like if, if if injuries didn't like take over his career, bro. Like if he wasn't that injured, bro, he probably would have been the best power forward of all time, bro. Like, or one of the For best the power forwards. Players, it was a chance to see how they'd match up against the world's best. For Coach Daly. It was an opportunity to get his stars to grow into a single unit. I think we're somewhere between the mentality of an all-star game and trying to come together as a team. So we've got to continually work on this. Daly had been hired for his ability to manage personalities and egos. And when the scrimmage began, it became apparent that his players had left one of their biggest weapons, those egos, somewhere else. The non-fan would think. Ooh. Well, they're going to go in there, and they're each going to want their own ball, and Jordan's going to be hogging the ball, and, you know, Magic's going to be dribbling all over the place. Point of fact, it was the exact opposite. They overpassed. It was like, I don't want to start it off. You know, you do it. And before you realize it, the select team was beating us by 10. We didn't know how to play with each other. We didn't want to step on anybody's toes or hurt any egos. And so these young kids... They were killing us. We were not into it, and we paid for it. 
Chris Webber was a man. I thought, boy, that's the guys come this league. I need to get out of here. Bobby Hurley was dominant. I did have some success penetrating and collapsing the defense, and our energy, our excitement to play, all those things played in our favor. Bobby Hurley didn't play two seasons in the NBA. Nevertheless, it did expose Damn. the one weakness they could have had, which is defending against quick guards. They were playing great. Then I noticed that Michael Jordan is not playing. I'm saying something. Chuck, then he said, we're all right. Yeah, we're all right. Daly watched as his players failed to make up the deficit. And in their first taste of outside competition, the dream team lost. A story their coach didn't want the press to get their hands on. I remember Chuck saying, as soon as the, the game ended and we were getting ready to let media in, it was a race of scoreboard. <laughs> the media comes in, scores, if not hundreds, they can sense something. You can feel the, the tension or the, you can feel something in the air. Well, Damn. some of these college players we've just got through playing against probably should be on this team, but uh, <laughs> uh, they'll get their chance. The teams pose for a picture together, both not sure what to make of what had just happened. But the man in charge may have had the answer. He threw the game. You know, Chuck threw the game. If you look how much Jordan played and how he sub guys in, not picking up, not making any adjustments, he knew what he was doing. It was legit. It felt tremendous. You know, what we were doing that day, you know, they couldn't stop it. <laughs> there are kids who believe in Santa Claus, too, and in the, and the Easter Bunny, and now that they've grown up, I hate to burst their bubble, but uh, uh, it was a game thrown. <laughs> Not many people would have done it, and he did it. It was gratifying to Chuck for us to get our butts beat like that because now we had to listen to him. From then on, he had a way of just saying, you know, you could lose. After fixing his collars and his hair, his speech was, anybody can get beat, so you got to be ready to play. And I think that's the only speech he ever gave us. The message got across. I mean, Ch you know, Chuck couldn't have been happier, I'm sure. It was brilliant on Chuck's part to be able to orchestrate that and play along like he didn't. Why didn't he tell you guys? We probably would have screwed it up. The next day, training camp ended with a rematch against the college kids. And once play started, everything made sense again. The tables were turned drastically. We showed them why, why we are who we are. We, we pretty much beat them Jeez. by 100. They couldn't score. <laughs> and by the way, Jordan played a lot more that next scrimmage. Hey. Jeez. Before the Dream Team could play in the 1992 Olympics, they had to qualify. The place to do that was Portland, Oregon, and the Tournament of the Americas. It would be the public's first chance to see the NBA stars together in a game, especially Jordan, Bird, and Magic. Daly had asked all three to be team captains, but Jordan had turned him down. I knew how much it meant to both of those guys because they never had the opportunity to play on the Olympics. So I'd say, you know what? Chuck, don't worry about me. You know, let these old dogs do it. Magic and Bird weren't just the team's oldest players. They were also the most revered. They had entered the league together in 1979, embarking on a rivalry that had redefined the NBA. And along the way, their personal admiration for one another had grown. Magic's just a great basketball player. He's the best I've ever seen, you know. I. Unbelievable. I don't know what to say. In 1992, they'd be getting the chance to share the ball. But the opportunity would be coming at the end of their careers. 
Bird had given his soul to the game. But after so many years, his body was betraying him. Damn. I had back problems. It just gets to the point where you just couldn't play. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't think, couldn't move, uh, couldn't run. You know, if you can't feel your feet, it's hard to run. Larry was on the fence because of his back, so I said, man, LP, you got to play, man. You got to play. This is our last chance to be together. Magic would be able to convince his old friend to play. But at the start of the 1991-92 NBA season, he was forced to retire after learning he had the HIV virus. Doctors would eventually clear him to play in the Olympics, though that didn't stop fears from swirling. There's a lot of players that really didn't want him to play, didn't want to play with him or against him, because nobody knew what disease meant. You know, they say, you get a little blood on you, you got HIV, or you breathe on you, you know? Damn. Uh, I never bought any of that, you know? I just, you just keep going. And that's what Irving decided to do, just keep pushing, keep going. Six, five, three-pointer, yes, oh, my! Jeez! Magic had made a cameo in the 1992 All-Star Game and had focused his attention on the Olympics, hoping for an encore of a lifetime alongside his old rival. Our careers were really over, and it was something I thought needed to happen for both of us. Their debut would take place at Portland's Rose Garden, with their team needing to medal in the Tournament of the Americas to qualify for the Olympics. That seemed like a foregone conclusion to just about everyone, including their first opponents, who were comp- Hey, man, you know what's crazy, bro? You know what's crazy? I hate that... I hate that I missed all of this shit, bro. Like, I wish I was alive to see this, to, to see all of this shit happen, bro. For real. Like... I, I really do hate that I missed all of this, man. Like, yo, look at this greatness, bro. Like, you got, you got Matt Johnson, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, like well, all these, all these, all these players, bro. Like, I don't know, man. Like, I, I I'm, I'm kind of, that's that shit sucks, bro. That I missed all of this, like, bro. That sucks. bro. Completely in awe before the game even started. But at least I was around for like 2008 and 2012 and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? And even the the, the Olympics, the, the Olympic team that just played this year, I was, you know, I watched that shit too. But like, they were really good. They were really good. Like they did. They were. They went undefeated too. The Cuban team spontaneously like drops to its knees as if twelve popes had come by on Easter Sunday. At that point, the idea that this is merely a basketball game has been ripped asunder. Sheesh. It was a surreal feeling. She's like, dude, we, we're here to kick y'all behind. And they want to take pictures with you. <laughs> then the game begins. Magic and Larry come out together, two guys that had saved the league. They wouldn't even be playing this game without those two. And Magic passed the ball. Larry makes the first basket. Bird banking in. Goes to the fadeaway. Sheesh. Larry Bird. I mean, you know, it just, it just didn't get any better than that. The U.S. was off and running, and the result was a thing of beauty. Johnson leading the break. Mm. And no one seemed more excited to be sharing the court than the co-captains. Bird for three. Opening night was a smashing Damn. success, with the outcome never in doubt. Oh, a bullet from Magic to Portland. And late in the game, the fans in Portland decided they wanted a curtain call from a three-time MVP. The crowd start cheering. Larry, Larry, Larry. And as he'd done so many other times in his career, Larry Bird rose to the occasion. Jordan with the behind the back save. Here's Bird. You can't leave him wide open, baby. That's wet like water. It was a virtually flawless performance. No cash nasty. The final margin of victory was 77 points. And Magic and Bird had led the way. For Magic in particular, after a year out of the game, 
the victory had a special kind of meaning. Living with HIV, never even thinking that I would ever have a chance to play basketball again and then basketball for the uh, United States. There was therapy for me and I needed that in the worst way. And then there was the matter of making sure Michael Jordan knew he was back as well. Yeah, you hear what the captain said? The captain said, sit down, sit down or this boat is going to sink. That's right, have a seat because you're going to fall. That's and the captain, that's the old, that's, don't a, that's the seniority right there. I know it. Sit you. With Magic sit you. and Michael, there was that little extra something <laughs> there, you know, <laughs> and the, something kind of to prove to each other. I took it upon myself to always shoot with Michael. OK, MJ, free throws today. Who was the first one to 50? Or we had little games. Who, who was the better shooter? <laughs> he didn't want to relinquish that control of the 80s, in a sense, even though we were going into the 90s. Don't touch the phone. One hand, don't touch it. Uh. Sheesh. Dang. Don't touch it. Oh. You know, he just come off missing a whole year. So it was grueling. Hey, Who's going to have the bragging rights by the end of this trip? You can't get too close to Michael. It's a foul. <laughs> you haven't committed a foul in almost a year and a half. Man, how can you talk? <laughs> Michael's always tried to let people know that he's the top dog in, in whatever. That's just his competitive mode. I'm the young guy with the old, uh, elder <laughs> statesman. These old guys, they got all the right. They can't stand in one spot too long. He's a young puppy. I'm the big dog here. Whatever I say goes. While the way of Magic and Michael's Can You Top This Challenge remained in doubt, when it came to facing the competition in the Tournament of the Americas, the team stood united. When we took the court in Portland, which, you know, we're on home ground, we wanted to showcase to the fans who we would be representing them. The lead is 30. Steel. Jordan. Jordan. I'm going to send a message around the world today that y'all can give it up. You foreigners can give it up. Mullins with a steal. Stockton has Mullins. Goes the other way. Stockton set him up perfectly. The Ooh. Americans won their six games at the tournament by an average of 50 points. All right, Larry. Um, Damn. Your impressions of tonight's game. <laughs> the gold medal was no surprise. But what was unexpected. <laughs> you see, he just laughed because he's just like, because he's just like, bro, like, in <laughs> my impression, of, the, of course, like, we, <laughs> that was a breeze. That, that <laughs> what do you mean? But nah, man, I, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> that's your funny as hell, man. But yo, um, I think this is going to, uh, where we ended off here, um, with that being said, uh, Hope you guys enjoyed that reaction. Thank you for thank you guys for watching. Um, part two is gonna be coming soon, so stay tuned for that. And also, I want to let you guys know that um, I appreciate all the love and support you guys have been uh, showing me lately. And I'll uh, see you guys in the next video. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button. Get this video to like 50 likes, and I'll react to part to part two. Yeah, part two. So yeah. With that being said, I'm out, man. Peace! Thank you for watching.